Amen. Good morning. We have for our first presentations had an overview of the Midnight Cry message as it developed, um, particularly from 2016, the increase of knowledge through the formalisation. We spoke of that message being formalised in October 3, 2018 in Arkansas uh, and later October 13 in France. I gave a little more history of that period of time than has been done before, um, showing how at the very outset, the very day that it's presented, it causes a disagreement or a sh shaking within this movement, not over the date November 9, but over the, the concept or understanding of two streams of information. How the, on October 3, when the message was first presented, uh, Elder Jeff immediately uh, reacted against that understanding. I just want to remind us of that fact that, that in October 3, at that very moment, that was where the controversy began and that is what, what has continued to be controversy all the way through, whether it was um, at the very camp meeting after the midnight cry message was given, uh, whether it began to be undermined, it had to be reinforced with the study of the repeating pattern, Boston Concord Exeter, reinforced again with the Battle of Ipsus, uh, and, and so forth, all through the, the year, highlighting how clear prophecy is in demonstrating these two streams of information. And then, just after the German camp meeting, held um, uh, about six <coughs> weeks, two months ago, uh, Elder Jeff and FFA and his followers separated themselves from the movement. And the very ver first video he does announcing that, attacking the leadership of this movement, saying we're in apostasy and separating himself from us, is a video entitled Hiding Mother Angelica. It's the first video Elder Jeff presents as an attack on this message, on the leadership of this movement, and what he's attacking, as was attacked on October 3, is the message of two streams of information. And the essence of what he shared was this. I have taught from October throughout the year that in this history of 1989 to 9-11, you have this increase of knowledge and this formalization in 1996. And this is the formalization of the first angel's message. And we've known 1996 as a formalization of the message through the Time of the End magazine. And what I highlighted was separate to the formalization of our first angel's message. You also have these external information streams also being formalized. Now, I, I have been fairly broad with that. I've been happy for people to just see as this, this as an overall formalization. You can place... Uh, first of all, I'll show what Elder Jeff presents. This is the beginning of Fox News. Fox News is the propaganda mouthpiece, mouthpiece of the evangelical far right today. <coughs> the mouthpiece of Donald Trump and his administration and those who support him. So you have Fox News coming to existence. So Fox News or the, the information stream for apostate Protestantism is also formalized in 1996. And throughout the presentations, um, including last October, I've also highlighted just almost as a curiosity but also prophetically significant how many other information sources also you find either coming into existence on, in 1996 or in some way transforming. And I have listed uh, New York 
the New York Times, the Washington Post. Um, they both go online. They don't begin in 1996, but they take advantage of this new World Wide Web and they go online. Uh, it's the beginning of Yahoo News. And one of the ones that I find most fascinating is Cryptome. There was a young Australian man who saw this website, Cryptome. Cryptome was this website that enabled people to anonymously leak private information. This Australian man saw this website, Cryptome, and it said, I like this hacking business. I like this releasing of government secrets anonymously. And he asked the creator of Cryptome, can I work with you? And the creator of Cryptome said, no, I work alone. So that young Australian man, Julian Assange, said, that's fine, I'll start my own. And he started WikiLeaks. Cryptome was the predecessor of WikiLeaks and it inspired Julian Assange. So even on that level, <coughs> which you wouldn't put in any key prophetic box, Cryptome is formalized, these websites formalized in 1996. But the ones that we highlight, I have highlighted, is Fox News. And I've also taught that in this history, you see CNN bought over, it doesn't begin in 1996, but it's bought over by Time Warner. And that also transfer, um, really transforms the CNN network. So it's the year of news overall, externally and internally. What Elder Jeff taught when he came out and attacked this message about six weeks ago was that he's found a third. See, what I teach is that Fox News and CNN are two information streams within the United States. So if you look at Donald Trump today, it's 2019. How many different narratives do you have within America about who he is. Is he Cyrus, the savior of the United States, or is he a dictator, the destroyer of the Constitution? Because you have a choice between two different narratives. CNN will say he's destroying the United States and he's raising up as a dictator. Fox News will say he's been raised up of God. He's the biblical fulfillment of King Cyrus and he's res restoring America as, as a city on the hill, as God's people. Which one is right prophetically? Prophecy is clear. This side is correct. In fact, they have, they have in so many ways evidence, given evidence to our prophetic message. So you have inside the United States two streams of information. What Elder Jeff teaches is that this, it's not... Fox News versus CNN, what he has pushed from the very beginning, from October 3, is that they are both equally bad. So conservatives who say Donald Trump is their, the saviour savior of the United States, they're bad because he would say they're the voice of the false prophet. So Elder Jeff would say Fox <laughs> equals the mouthpiece or the voice of the false prophet. He would say that CNN, those liberals who are saying Donald Trump is a dictator, that they are also bad and they are the beast of the UN, who he calls the dragon. The first problem I had with that is, on what level does CNN speak for the United Nations? Go into a definition of what the United Nations actually are. CNN does not speak for Ukraine or Germany or India, they speak for a portion of the American public within the United States who believe that their country is under the control of a rising dictatorship. But he would say that CNN is the mouthpiece of the UN. And then what he came out with at the beginning, uh, or just after the German camp meeting, is this study, Hiding Mother Angelica. And he said, that he has proof now that he was correct because he's found another one. There's 
there was a Catholic nun, Mother Angelica, who started a news network. And you can place that news network in some fashion in 1996, and it's the largest Catholic news network today. So he teaches that you have the, the mouthpiece of the false prophet, the mouthpiece of the dragon, and the mouthpiece of the beast. And that they are all equally bad, all equally wicked. And I addressed that yesterday where I said well, the first problem out of many problems is who is doing the ploughing of the Nethanims because you would have to either decide that the false prophet is ploughing the Nethanims, the dragon is ploughing the Nethanims or the beast is ploughing the Nethanims. And you know that that makes absolutely no logical sense. So this is just a little bit of a background um, back into our study. This is really the core disagreement that developed from October 3, this disagreement about whether or not you have these three information streams formalised in 1996, these three information streams that are equally bad, or whether or not you have many information streams formalised, but that Fox News and CNN are two information streams within the United States, one uh, speaking for apostate Protestantism, and one doing the work of ploughing the Nethanims. So, back to our study of the counterfeit. That was just a short introduction. Yesterday we began to revisit this study of the counterfeit, and we showed how you have the story of the true, you have a period of scattering, and God gathers his people in 1798 by raising up a messenger who, although not appearing to at first, is by the end of that history, that 46-year history, he's going to overthrow the leadership of God's church and, and bring in this testing message that's going to be, cause a division within the church. This messenger was William Miller. And what tests God's people was a three-step prophetic testing message. This is a 46-year history. In 1818, he has his message in a capsule. In 1833, it's formalised. He received his credentials and he begins travelling and his teaching. In 1844, it ends in disappointment and failure. In that same history, you have Ellen White rising up as a, as a prophet receiving direct revelation from God. You take that to the counterfeit. They had gone into apostasy when they abolished the Jesuit order. They've begun disobeying their boss. In 1798, they're scattered. They go into captivity. Satan needs to raise up a new leadership from within the Catholic Church. It's going to be divisive. He's going to make a lot of enemies. And that new leadership was Eugenio Pacelli. In 1899, he becomes a priest and he begins to study Code of Canon Law. In 1917, he has his message in a capsule. The Code of Canon Law is completed. <coughs> the same day that he's made a, a, a bishop to be sent to Germany is the same day of, as the visions of Fatima. So you have the Code of Canon Law and the message of Fatima. One is going to give the ideology the spiritual, and one is going to give the leadership, the structural. Both formalised, or both in a capsule form, but not yet formalised in the 13th of May, 1917. 1933, you have that message formalised. It's signed into law with, with a concordat with Hitler, and that also places Hitler as a dictatorship. And Eugenio Pacelli then takes over the leadership of the Catholic Church. He begins destroying the documents of his predecessor, restructuring the Catholic Church as Pope Pius XII. And in this history, that caused a civil war intern internally. He was hated by the leadership, the Catholic leadership in Germany. And what is Germany in this history? The King of the North. So you can see Pope Pius XII has major issues with his church in Germany. And Germany, in this history, was the king of the north. But it ends in disappointment and failure. This is a 46-year history, beginning in 1798 and ending in 1844. This is a 46-year history. 
beginning in 1899 and ending in 1945. Disappointment and failure, disappointment and failure. Their message had existed in its capsule form from 1818 and from 1917, formalised in 1833, formalised in 1933. Ending in disappointment, they go into a scattering time, just trying to save what is left of their, of their church. Ellen White announces that they are entering into a new gathering time, November 1, 1850, and she points her church back to the messages given in this history that were written on the 1843 chart. Pius XII, he here begins a new gathering time to a million strong, strong crowd announces the dogma of the Assumption of Mary. He's pointing his church back to Mary and the messages of Fatima from this history. They enter into a gathering time. It goes nowhere. By now, Adventism is in, Laodice, in a Laodicean condition. The Catholic Church was in a Laodicean condition. 1863, Organisation, rejection of the prophetic message. 1962, reorganisation, rejection of their prophetic message. And then you have this period where there is another attempt to finish the work. This happened under the message of Jones and Wagner, but he was half right, half wrong. He was opposed by the leadership of Butler, who released a book titled, uh, based on the book of Galatians, attacking the message of Wagner. 1989 for the Catholic Church was their 1888 experience. You had John Paul II. He was half right and half wrong. He wants to take down the Soviet Union, but he also was in direct opposition to the Jesuits and the reorganization of the Second Vatican Council. And we all agreed yesterday that that reorganization for the Catholic Church's work at the end of the world was a good thing. For them, for Satan, their boss, it was a good thing. So the Jesuits are again under attack. Remember, they went into a scattering originally because they wouldn't listen to their Jesuit order. And John Paul was opposing their Jesuit order. <coughs> 1987, a book written by a close associate of John Paul II, Malachi Martin, saying the Jesuits, the betrayal of the Roman Catholic Church, essentially saying the Jesuits had betrayed the Catholic Church. So this continues a history in the Catholic Church's scattering. The years after the fall of the Soviet Union for John Paul II were not happy ones. He recognised that his agenda in Eastern Europe and his agenda to work with the United States government was a complete and utter failure. He knew that before 1991. By 1990, he's trying to work with the United States in this in the Middle East where you have this conflict that developed into Desert Storm and the Gulf War. By the time you get to Desert Storm, the United States is saying, we appreciate your opinion, John Paul II, but who are you to tell us what we can do militarily? And they refuse to take any counsel from the Pope. So any type of alliance from the United States perspective ends at least by 1991. They no longer need the Pope. Communism has fallen, the Soviet Union has fallen. They don't need John Paul II anymore. So by the time you get to 1991 and after that history, he's known as the angry Pope. He was very angry about how that history, the results of that history. So you have this Catholic Church in a scattering time. This movement has been in existence for 30 years now. How much of a head start do you think Satan is going to give us when he knows that after two histories of failure, this is now the end of the world? Satan knows that. He knows that this is the end. How much of a head start is he going to give us? You have John Paul II failing in 1991. You have this split in the Catholic Church, this civil war between John Paul II and the Jesuits. And we say Jesuits kind of broadly, but really they, they are the liberal faction in the Catholic Church. What these 
liberal, what this liberal fashion, faction began to recognise was that John Paul II was not on their side and John Paul II is preparing up his predecessor. He's stacking all the cards on this Cardinal Ratzinger who John Paul II wants to succeed him. So this liberal faction within the Catholic Church is recognising that John Paul II is not on their side and they do not want another Pope like him next elected. And they know that John Paul II is training up Cardinal Ratzinger to replace him. So what they do is they come together and they form a group. And this group comes together in the history of 1996. And they are known as the St. Galen Group. They jokingly would refer to themselves as the St. Galen Mafia. And they were a collection of, of these high-ranking archbishops, bishops, cardinals within the Catholic Church who were opposed to John Paul II, opposed to another conservative pope. And what they wanted to do was to elect a pope who aligned with their views, with the views of the liberal Jesuit faction, and trans would transform the Catholic Church from the inside. They wanted to overthrow the leadership of the Catholic Church from the inside, bring about a reformation. This St. Galen group came together in 1996. In 2015, it became much more open what they had been about. John Paul II knew that they existed, but he had, in his attempts to to dig out who his enemies were, he had failed to be able to dig out the names. So he had, attempted, he had attempted to take them down, but they were too secretive. In 2015, one of the chief, really there were three main cardinals in this St. Galen group, one of those cardinals wrote his autobiography. He's Cardinal Godfrey de Niels. And he, he laid out this history in a much more open fashion. And this is an, an article from the National Catholic Register dated September 24, 2015. It says, Serious concerns are being raised about Cardinal Godfrey de Niels, one of the papal delegates chosen to attend the upcoming Ordinary Synod on the Family, after the Archbishop of Brussels confessed this week to being part of a radical mafia reformist group opposed to Benedict XVI. So in 1996, they come together to try and stop Cardinal Ratzinger being the next Pope. They failed in that attempt. Cardinal Ratzinger became Benedict XVI. He's known, Godfrey de Niels is known as this radical reformer, liberal reformer within the Catholic Church. And this article goes on to state some of his beliefs that differ from conservative, traditional Catholic thinking. At the launch of the book in Brussels this week, September of 2015, Cardinal de Niel said he was part of a secret club of cardinals opposed to Benedict XVI. He called it a mafia club that bore the name of St. Galen. The group wanted a drastic reformation of the Catholic Church to make it much more modern. And they had a name... They had a cardinal they wanted to head it. His name was Cardinal Jorge Bergoglio. So there was three main cardinals of this St. Galen group. The one we just mentioned was Cardinal de Niels. He was the Archbishop of Brussels. Another was Martini. Cardinal Martini, and a third, the Archbishop of Milan, Cardinal Casper. These are the three known as, the kind of known as the triumvirate. Cardinal Martini is one of the most fascinating. He would teach that the Catholic Church is in this pompous, tired condition. Essentially, the Catholic Church is Laodicean, and it's time for a renewal. He would teach that the Catholic Church is entering into a 
prophetic time period when they should expect surprising developments through the work of the Holy Spirit. And this Cardinal Martini, he was a particular tutor of another man rising up within the Catholic ranks, Bergoglio. Jorge Mario Bergoglio. Bergoglio was tutored within this St. Galen group. In 2001, prior to 2001, Bergoglio had not met him. So in 1996, this group comes together, but they don't yet have their man. Martini is, is mentoring this young Bergoglio, but these three are looking for looking for someone who's going to be able to conduct this reformation within the Catholic Church. In 2001, Jorge Mario Bergoglio is made a cardinal. And that same year, in 2001, he meets the St. Galen group. And they found their man to overturn the leadership of the Catholic Church and reform it. In 1899, Eugenio Pacelli is made a priest and he comes under the tutorship of Cardinal Gaspari. He's going to rise up through the ranks, completely reform the Catholic Church and become Pope Pius XII. In 2001, Jorge Bergoglio becomes a cardinal. He meets with the St. Galen group. He's tutored under them. He's going to rise up, become Pope Francis in 2013 and begin the work of reforming the Catholic Church. 1899 is the beginning of the Alpha history of modern Babylon. 2001 is the beginning of the Omega history of modern Babylon. 2001, he begins training under them, but it takes time. They fail to have him elected at the death of John Paul II, but in 2013... They succeed and he becomes Pope Francis. And he's begun this work of implementing the ideology of the St. Galen group, which has caused, if you have followed the, what is happening internally in the Catholic Church the last few years, it's caused a civil war. What they are fearing will be the greatest schism in centuries. In this history, Pope Pius XII, who, who were his greatest enemies within his own church? It was Pope Pius XII versus the German cardinals. They didn't like him. He had to force them under his control. Who's the, where does the greatest opposition to Pope Francis exist today? Within the United States. He's having to force the United States Catholic leadership back under the control of the Vatican. Pope Pius XII fighting for the control of his church within the King of the North. Pope Francis fighting for control of his church within the King of the North. Bergoglio was elected as Pope in 2013 and it came time for him to choose his name. I want to read... This paragraph, I'll read excerpts from this paragraph regarding the history of, of their St. Francis. In the history of their St. Francis, about 1,200 years ago, the Catholic Church was in trouble. Many bishops and priests were absent pastors. Those were in residence who were in residence oftentimes were causes of scandal by their lax morals and bad example. So the Catholic Church in the history of, of Francis was in a bad condition. A man named Giovanni Barnadone was praying in a church named after St. Damien in front of a crucifix. This is their narrative of St. Francis. The figure of Jesus on that crucifix suddenly called out to him by his common nickname, which came from the fact that his father was French and said, Francis, rebuild my house. 
The man who became eventually the great St. Francis thought the Lord was asking him to repair the dilapidated church of St. Damien. So he went to his father's clothing store, took some valuable fabrics and sold them along with a horse in order to start repairing the church. He soon realized that that was not what he was being called for. When this figure called to him, Francis, rebuild my house, he came to realize soon after that he was called to rebuild the church as a whole. He was being called to rebuild the entire household of God. How did St. Francis rebuild the church? He helped bring the church back to her foundations so that the church could be rebuilt stone by stone on the foundation of Christ. What is the message of Francis? Rebuild the church. Take it back to its old paths, back to its foundations, and repair the temple. So from 2013 forward, what is Pope Francis's mission? What is our mission? Take the church back to its foundations, back to the old paths, and restore the temple. Francis has chosen the exact counterfeit name to do the exact same work within the Catholic Church. And why didn't he pick the name Francis I? They always take a number, even if they're the first pope. Choosing that name, they become the first. Always the number. He refused. He said, I will not be Francis the first. He's just Francis. Because he knows, according to Catholic prophecy, one Catholic prophecy, he's also the only Francis. He's the last Francis. So he followed a calling to rebuild the temple. And this has been from 1996 forward, this effort to overturn the Catholic leadership from the inside. In 2001, they have their man. In 2013, he's elected. It's in 2014 that he begins this process in a real way of restructuring the way the Catholic Church operates. And there were some important uh, synods in 2014, some extremely controversial meetings uh, within the Catholic Church in 2014 where he began to do that work. In some factions of the Catholic Church, he's now known as the dictator pope and extremely hated. We'll go into some more of that history. So the Catholic Church is in a state of civil war. God is sorting out his church, restoring it from the inside, and Satan is doing the exact same within the papacy. He also has a new leadership rising up. I don't want to go into all the details of what has happened. We know that last year that there was uh, Archbishop Vigano released a paper calling on Pope Francis to step down. Uh, and it was really not just Archbishop Vigano, but a huge faction within the Catholic Church who believe that Pope Francis is an imposter. He is, they would teach the Antichrist within their own church and that he needs to, uh, he, he needs to really be cleansed from the church and, and removed so that they, the church can be restored. So Vigano publicly, for the first time, they make this public call for Francis to, to step down as Pope. So we can go into all that history, but I want to highlight one particular history. We know that our dispensation is 2014. To 2019. And so much of what we see happening, you can place, bookend it with these two dates. Just when you think about uh, the rise of the Christian right, you can bookend it with these dates. When you think about um, Islam, an Islamic caliphate, Baghdadi, 2014. Caliphate loses all of their land. Baghdadi killed, 2019. You can bookend this history, whatever line you're threading. I want to just use one thread, one story, and that has been the work that began in 2014 for an Amazonian synod at the Vatican. 
A synod is a meeting of specific high-ranking Catholic officials. They meet together and they write a proposal or recommendations to give to the Pope. So that it, synod is really just a meeting of specific high-ranking Catholic clergy and they make recommendations to the Pope, uh, recommendations that they would like to see implemented within the Catholic Church. In 2014, Pope Francis begins preparing an Amazonian synod. So, at the time we won't go into all the details, but they, Pope Francis and his followers and this, this St. Galen group, they believe in something known as liberation theology. And this is within conservative Catholicism seen as heretical. They believe in liberation theology. They, the conservatives within Catholicism believe that it is not only heretical, but also the politicizing of the Catholic Church. Liberation theology is a movement within Christian theology developed mainly by Latin American Roman Catholics, which attempts to address the problems of poverty and social injustice as well as spiritual matters. So they're not just dealing with spiritual matters, it's also relating to people's rights, poverty and social injustice. And those opposed to Pope Francis attack him, saying that he is making the Catholic Church political. That is both an interesting compare and contrast and also quite... Um, quite a curious statement when you consider how political John Paul II was. So it's also quite, um, what's the word? Sorry? Hypocritical. hypocritical. Quite hypocritical. The conservatives will say John Paul II wasn't political, but now that you start dealing with something like social justice and treating people right, all of a sudden Pope Francis is making the Catholic Church political. It's hypocrisy. It's the same hypocrisy we see inside the movement now outside the movement by those attacking us. So in 2014, he, he creates something called REPAM. And REPAM was the organization who was tasked with preparing an Amazonian synod. REPAM was set up in 2014 in answer to the grave concerns of Pope Francis and the Latin American church regarding the deep wounds that Amazonia and its people bear. So it's particularly focusing on Brazil. It embodies the promise Pope Francis made in the Amazon town of Maldonado, Peru, to affirm a wholehearted option for the defense of life, the defense of the earth, and the defense of cultures. It stands for the Red Ecclesial Pan Amazonica, or Pan-Amazonian Ecclesial Network. So REPAM was the preparation work for an Amazonian synod. And as you can imagine, this is already causing stirs within the Catholic Church. What I want us to see is this is bigger than just South America, bigger than just Peru and, and Brazil. This Amazonian synod is particularly an interesting chiasm, it's now particularly being pushed by the Catholic leadership in Germany, pretty much by the lib liberal Catholic cardinals all over the world, but particularly Germany. So it's a worldwide, it's a worldwide movement. <coughs> and there's specific reasons why Germany would care about the Catholic Church in Peru and Brazil. There's, I'm going to quote here from an article. This is a German bishop, uh, Bishop Krautler, and this is quoting him from April 4 of 2014. He's talking about the issues within Brazil. He said, I first, he meets with Pope Francis, and he says, in that meeting, I referred first to our communities and regretted that because of the great shortage of ordained ministers, they only have access to the Eucharist a few times a year. The Pope then suggests to the bishop, 
Why don't you ordain married men? And what is that within the Catholic Church? Heresy. Pope Francis told this bishop to make bold proposals with regard, with regard to the shortage of priests. In 2014, Cardinal Humes, in connection with Bishop Crawler, bring up the idea of ordaining married men in the frame of the Brazilian Bishops' Conference. September 12, 2014, REPAM was officially founded in Brasilia at a September 9 to 12 gathering in Brasilia, Brazil. This is just stepping through this history, how it's been, this Amazonian synod has been in preparation for these five years. But these cardinals, their agenda, what they want to see happen within this Amazonian region is the ordination of married priests and they also want to see women deacons, both of which beliefs are heretical within the conservative Catholic Church faction. At this stage, they're only pushing for women to be ordained as deacons within the Catholic Church. But this is where the Anglican Church began, and everyone knows that. The Anglican Church began by, by um, making the deacon office open to women, and soon after, they were able to make women equal on all levels. So it's the first step, and everyone knows it's the first step. So this is an issue about marriage and about the role of women within the Catholic Church. March 2 of 2015, the Vatican hosts a press conference presenting REPAM to the public. 2017, Pope Francis convokes the Synod of Bishops on the Pan-Amazon region. November 2017, in Ecuador, there's the first gathering organised by REPAM, which is there to organise and discuss the upcoming Amazon Synod. January 19, 2018, Pope Francis convokes the first pre-synodal council. So this is just all how this preparation has happened over 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. And then into February 2019, REPAM goes to Washington, D.C. in order to present the Amazon Synod and lay out some of its main goals. It's the Jesuits in Washington, D.C. hosted uh, REPAM, REPAM there. And you also notice that Pope Francis is the first pope in Catholic history who's a Jesuit, so that they're working closely together. When we talk about the Jesuits, I want us to remove from our mind our conspiracy theories of some secret organisation. The work the Jesuits are doing was public back in 1773 history. It's public now. You can see it. If we start relying on conspiracy theories and hearsay about what the Jesuits are doing, we're heading into the same territory as Donald Trump. What the Jesuits are doing is public and open. They are the nice faction within the Catholic Church. They are the ones fighting for, for liberation theology, for taking care of the planet, for human rights. So June 26, 2019, there's a secret meeting near Rome with a number of cardinals and bishops and a couple of other key figures. A final statement of that event, this secret meeting, one of the final steps in preparation for the Amazon Synod, was made a final statement calling for the ordination of female deacons. This, all of this history of 14 to 19 that I've just read is from a website known as LifeSite News. This is a Catholic news website and they are against Pope Francis. So they finalise their, they finalise their summary of this history of 14 to 19 with the following statement. This short overview that they've just given gives the impression that the Amazon Synod is being organised mostly by a close-knit group of people who have been working for years together, trying to advance their agenda that is influenced by liberation theology. 
So you can see LifeSite News of what I just quoted are against this synod and against Pope Francis. If you can try and remember them. I want to quote now from another Catholic website. They say the rhetoric against Francis is unprecedented in the last 200 years. This is quoting Jesuit Mark Massa, director of the Center for Religion and American Public Life at Boston College. He says this is a stirring, this is stirring up a pot which if it boils over may very well be guilty of causing a schism within the Catholic Church. They, the conservative Catholic faction, are afraid of Francis's efforts of reform and are willing to do almost anything or align themselves with anyone to stop him. This Amazonian synod came together just in the last few weeks. It finished, um, it finished, I believe, last week. It had been in preparation since 2014. And this, those specially chosen Catholic leaders wrote this document of recommendation to the Pope and they recommended that the Pope in this area of South America allow, make it formally permissible to ordain married priests and women deacons, just as they had been expecting and encouraging through those years. All of this has caused a great shaking within the Catholic Church. So when you come to the first days of that Amazon Synod, when Pope Francis was opening the Synod, a delegation from the area of the Amazon with the, the native tribes arrived at the Vatican with their feather headdresses, with their traditional dress, and with five statues, five wooden statues of a naked pregnant woman. So you have the Vatican, you have Francis, and you have this, this group come from the Amazon region, this group of Catholics representing their cultures. They have their feather headdresses, their traditional garments, and they have these five statutes, and they, they're these five pregnant women, and she's naked. And you can see it's like a cross-section. You can just see this wooden belly and a baby inside. This caused outrage within the Catholic Church, so much so that after the, the ceremony, the Pope put these statues of these women in a, in a Catholic church, and one of these conservative Catholics flew from another country, went into that church, videoed him, someone videoed him, he took those five statutes, and he threw them into the river in Rome. Pope Francis had someone fish them out of the river and bring them back, and he made an apology to the Amazonian people. But the conservative Catholics rejoiced they said that they had allowed this pagan culture to bring in these pagan idols into their Catholic church. And one, one cardinal said the great mistake was that Pope Francis ever allowed the idols into the Catholic church in the first place. So now it, it's, it, was, it was public. He told one Catholic broadcaster, EWTN, he said... To throw it out can be against human law, but to bring the idols into the church was a grave, a grave sin, a crime against divine law. EWTN later broadcast a video by the man who claimed he was the one that stole the statues, and he defended his actions and said those statues were a violation of the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. So what he did was a religious cleansing <coughs> of the church. A Vatican spokeswoman said, in the name of tradition and doctrine, they threw away a symbol of maternity and the sacredness of life. And they were labelled racists. The conservatives attacking those people, that delegation that came, one of the reasons they attacked them was for the feathered headdress. And what's the, res the response of the Pope? You don't like their feather headdresses. Have you seen the hats we wear in the Catholic Church? Have you seen our three-tiered crown? So Pope Francis' response is, you don't like their headdresses. What's your problem with our headdresses? They're ridiculous too, essentially. 
what I want us to see is the two different narratives existing in the Catholic Church. And I'm going to start to read some of these quotes. The one I want to particularly uh, read from, EWTN. EWTN is... is it's, it's tied to the Catholic Church. It's part of that. It, it's a voice for it. But it's also t associated with two others. The Church Militant... These are the most radical. They're the ones saying that Pope Francis is the Antichrist. They, they are what we would call the most independent of Adventist independents. They believe the Catholic Church leadership is in apostasy uh, and that, that they need to be thrown out. LifeSite News, similarly critical, um, not quite as radical as Church Militant. You find Church Militant on YouTube. They have tens of thousands of YouTube views. And their main audience is within the United States where there is the greatest opposition to Pope Francis. In EWTN and these Catholic Church conservatives, what they're teaching is that Francis is deliberately bringing about confusion so that Francis can bring in his new world order and his secret agenda. What I want us to see is that when you listen to Walter Vi and our conspiracy theories, they're not so special. I'm going to make some quotes now from another Catholic news site. This is the National Catholic Reporter. <coughs> the National Catholic Reporter. They're not quite as big as EWTN, but they are really the liberal voice, the liberal spokespeople within the Catholic Church. The National Catholic Reporter. I'm quoting from a, a, an article they put out on July. <coughs> Just quoting directly from the article. After more than a century of secret machinations, a group of Freemasons and communists aided by liberals, modernists, and a mafia of reforming church leaders, are able to subvert the Catholic Church from within, including electing a corrupt pope, all as part of a diabolical plot for world domination. The latest Dan Brown novel? No, it is the thesis of infiltration, the plot to destroy the church from within, by radical traditionalist Taylor Marshall. Taylor Marshall is the voice behind Church Militant. So what Church Militant teaches is what they just summarised as being the main tenets of his book, that the Catholic Church has been infiltrated from within and elected a, a false pope, a corrupt pope. The book's publisher turns out to be a small Catholic press that is affiliated with the Eternal Word television network, EWTN best known for its cable television channel, but also the owner of a radio station and, and broadcasts a newspaper, two online news services, and a religious goods catalogue and a book publishing arm. A truly global media empire, EWTN, that has given favourable coverage to Republican politicians and the Trump White House. EWTN also is a media star in a web of connections among wealthy conservative Catholic donors and even some anti-Pope Francis extremists. On Memorial Day, viewers who tuned into EWTN's News Nightly for news from a Catholic perspective were treated to two previously recorded one-on-one -on -one interviews by anchor Lauren Ashburn, two previously recorded interviews with Mike Pence and Sarah Huckabee Sanders. The segment was clear evidence of how a television outlet once devoted to expressions of Catholic piety and conservative catechists and apologetics has grown into a truly influential media empire, well connected to Republican politicians and the Trump White House, where the Catholic perspective is unabashedly partisan, has also become the media star in a web of connections including wealthy conservative Catholic donors and some of the most public anti-Pope Francis forces in the Catholic world. Those connections traceable through a maze of non-profit organisations 
helped fuel EWTN's development. It is a complex tale involving the matchup of a peculiar brand of US conservative Catholicism with conservative political ideology, ideology and economic theory. What they do, what National Catholic Reporter, the National Catholic Reporter does, is in July of this year they release a four-part series and it's a four-part takedown of EWTN, their conservative broadcasting rival. I'm quoting from two of those four articles. Quoting from a, a third article, what they begin to do is tie, show how Archbishop Vigano, who last year called for, publicly called for the removal of Pope Francis, is himself tied to the leadership behind EWTN. Archbishop Vigano recently released a book, Vigano versus the Vatican, the uncensored testimony of the Italian journalist who helped break the story. So Vigano releases a book, Vigano versus the Vatican. Its publication confirms another link between EWTN and Vigano. Vigano worked with, the e with EWTN board members in drafting his original letters and in the preparation of his book. Quoting uh, further down this article, nowhere is the division more blatant than on a recurring segment of the world over as a program on EWTN, featuring anchor Raymond Arroyo, who also has a, has a gig at Fox News. The segment has become little more than a Vatican bashing round table. Whether of how Francis is strengthening the Catholic teaching of the death penalty, how he's handling the sex abuse scandal, or different Catholic doctrines. Not surprisingly, they're also attacking the Amazonian Synod. Guests on the show are a who's who of Francis critics, including one col a columnist, they start listing a few columnists, who signed the 2017 filial correction letter that accused Pope Francis of being a heretic, and Cardinal Burke, one of four cardinals to openly challenge one of the Pope's apostolic letters. A cardinal who openly said that Pope Francis was in doctrinal heresy. So what this four-part series of National Catholic Reporter does is it takes down EWTN and it breaks, starts breaking down how EWTN is publicly and privately undermining Pope Francis. In the midst of July, a four-part series from the National Catholic Reporter about the Eternal Word television network, a media empire started in 1981 by a feisty nun and her religious order in the Deep South. What nun started EWTN? Mother Angelica. 1981, Mother Angelica starts, uh, starts EWTN. And what Elder Jeff teaches is that EWTN, not started in 1996, they got a few contracts here, so he wants to place a formalization here. I have no problem with that. If he wants to put it in this list, I'm fine with that. But what he is saying is that this network, EWTN, that Mother Angelica set up disproves two streams of information because now you have three and EWTN is the voice of the beast. A couple of problems I have with that. EWTN, does it speak for Pope Francis? No, it speaks for those who believe that he's a heretic within their church and needs to be removed. You can place its formalization in 1996, but you have two streams within the Catholic Church. What Elder Jeff has done was unwittingly, unintentionally give stronger evidence for the message of two streams of information. We have four subjects of the Midnight Cry that are all under discussion. We have the United States. We have Adventism. 
we have the papacy and we have our movement. These are the four external subjects that we are tre- threading the history of in the Midnight Cry message and in other messages that are currently being developed and presented. These are our four subjects. For every one of these subjects, what condition are they in internally? Civil war, civil war, civil war, and civil war. So we can come back to this model. And what I have said is that within, at, within the United States, they are in a civil war. And how many sides do you have if there's a civil war? Two sides. So how many d- narratives do you have? Two narratives. It's as simple as that. You have CNN and Fox. And Elder Jeff says no, because you have a network started by a feisty Catholic nun in the deep south who's extremely conservative, is fighting against liberalism, and all those men who gave rise to Pope Francis, she starts this network in 1996, and that is well and good. Elder Jeff would teach that I intentionally hid this network, intentionally knew that it was in some fashion formalised in 1996, but that I never presented that because I I didn't want to show the work of the papacy in this history. It's part of his narrative that I'm trying to cover up the work of the papacy and we discussed that yesterday. The midnight cry message began with Fatima and ended with the counterfeit. But EWTN, what Elder Jeff has given us is evidence of two streams of information because from, really from, depending how far you want to go back, I would highlight 1996, 2001, you have this civil war within the papacy. And in that civil war, you have two sides, as in any civil war, and two streams of information. And you have EWTN. EWTN is saying, we love our church, we are concerned about our pope, Have you seen the headdresses and the paganism? We need to pray for our Pope. This is their nicest reporting. We need to pray for him so he can be strong and resist the resist the temptation of all these wicked people. And you have National Catholic Reporter saying, What do you want about? Have you seen our headdresses? You have EWTN. I want to read one interesting quote. EWTN I'm going to quote from I'm going to quote from the National Catholic Reporter EWTN criticized that ceremony with those five wooden statues and they said this is ridiculous. EWTN said that this was a pagan ritual with these pagan Amazonian goddesses. They, they made the statements, this is quoting, this is EWTN, the identifiably Christian as- aspects of, of the ritu- rituals have taken place alongside unidentified images and sculptures with the incorporation of rituals of unclear origin, and this has led to confusion. So what EWTN is saying, Pope Francis has mingled um, identifiably Christian elements um, with these pagan rooted symbols and goddesses. How does National Catholic Reporter respond? Why is the carved image of a pregnant woman so tantalizing to these critics? But they have not a second thought for the Egyptian obelisk in the center of St. Peter's Square, nor the fresco of the Delphic Oracle in the Sistine Chapel. Remember that Philistines in earlier generations wanted the nudes on the Sistine Chapel covered. So EWTN says, this is terrible. There's these pagan goddesses at the Vatican and NCR says, do you know what an Egyptian obelisk is? 
Have you looked at the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel? EWTN is saying, these statues of women are naked. NCR says, have you seen inside your own church? I, I, this also brings back memories of Walter Weiss and what he's made conservative Adventism believe that somehow we have this secret knowledge of what an obelisk is. They know what an obelisk is. They know what that they have inside their own church. What they have, the fight they're in right now is over dispensationalism. EWTN and those affiliated with them are saying Pope Francis wants to bring in married priests and women deacons. I listened to an, a, a broadcast by Taylor Marshall on Church Militant this morning and he makes a strong emphatic position that teaching never changes. He's making a direct attack on dispensationalism that Pope Francis cannot come in and ordain a married priest because once it is decided that priests should not be married, nothing can change that. The argument is the civil war inside the papers is all about dispensationalism. And what does NCR say in response? NCR says in response, 150 years ago, the Catholic Church didn't believe in such a thing as democracy or in religious freedom. Do you remember your own history 150 years ago? So how can you say that your Catholic Church is not dispensational? You've changed your position, EWTN, on democracy. So this, art, this debate between these two streams of information within the Catholic Church is all about dispensationalism and whether or not Catholic tradition changes from one dispensation to another dispensation. Each one of these four, each one of these four subjects is in a state of civil war. And what we do throughout our studies is line them up and make comparisons, compare, compare and contrast them. USA, two streams of information. Only one of these streams is going to unite behind the movement that finishes the work. Fox is going to unite behind Donald Trump, already has finish the work, bring in the Sunday law. There's a movement here. NCR is uniting behind Francis, who was raised up in 2001, reforming the Catholic Church and is going to do a work. Same thing with the movement. There's two sides arguing about dispensationalism. And you know this movement, the leadership of this movement as it is today, are going to finish the work, complete the work this movement was raised up to do. The very first attack on the midnight cry in October 3 was about two streams of information. The first video Elder Jeff releases attacking the midnight cry and separating himself on this, from this message was about two streams of information, EWTN and Mother Angelica. You go into EWTN, you trace the way marks you thread history in our dispensation. You see the work of Pope Francis. Sorry? I want to leave this one for now, but you can see it um, just in the last, last few weeks. Uh, the, the conference structure has started punishing rebellious portions of the conference that are electing female deacons and elders. So that they are in a state of civil war. But I want to keep on the subject. 2014 to 2019, you have this civil war within the papacy. 2014, it's preparation from the, for the Amazonian Synod and is restructuring the Catholic Church. It's beginning in the Amazon. They all know that this is the beginning of a worldwide change relating to the marriage of the priesthood and women within the Catholic Church. 2019, it breaks into the open. You have the two main Catholic news networks at open war, one supporting Francis, one openly attacking Francis, 
one tied to the independent portions of the Catholic Church. This is an open civil war. If you want to know who speaks for the Francis leadership papacy, it's not EWTN. They are not his voice. The National Catholic Reporter is. So to claim that Mother Angelica and EWTN 1996 is some type of mouthpiece, they are not a mouthpiece for the papacy at the end of the world. Pope Francis is a counterfeit of this movement. And as a counterfeit of this movement, what has this movement been doing? Discussing dispensationalism, discussing equality and people's rights. That is being counterfeited within the papacy. You know that Pope Francis is the final pope that's going to finish the work. You know that this movement and the leadership of this movement as it currently exists is what is going to finish the work. I hope we can see how even the attacks on this message only serve to strengthen it. Ellen White makes this statement that those attacking the gospel message cannot help but give glory to God with their attacks. And even with this, even with the subject of half right, half wrong, made us go back into this history and see in a stronger fashion than we've ever seen before that we are in a history of success. And now when the attacks come again, attacking two streams of information, they only serve to strengthen it. If you kneel with me, we'll close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for our blessings. Thank you, Lord, that you reinforce, reinforce and strengthen the messages you've given us. Thank you, Lord, that we can have a sure foundation for our faith. Thank you, Lord, for its consistency. I pray, Lord, that we will be consistent, that we will have trust in you and faith in you, that the things that we don't understand, we will trust you to reveal them in your time. I put all into your hands. I put this movement into your hands. I pray for those that are being, um, that are being shaken by the, these um, disagreements with those attacking this movement. I pray, Lord, that they will be able to see and accept that you have led us in the past, you have led us these five years, that you're leading us now. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.